I had nicknames for most of them. X-Meth, Lizard Man, the Beach Nazi, except for Sylvia, who was in mid-transition, and Buck, who was half Cherokee. The other guys called Sylvia the Trap and Buck the Half-Breed. Retail grocery could be ugly behind the facade of bright lights and clean shelves. Winter Haven Supermarkets Incorporated was expanding up the East Coast, and a lot of ex-warehouse and CDL driver types were looking to get a piece of the employee-owned stock that came after a two-year commitment. Very few made it that long. Even the guys with years of experience in the stocking game, like myself, couldn't keep up with the workload at Winter Haven's. The job was especially rough on your legs. Shin splints and brittle knees were the most common outcome of a life lived between the aisles. I had worked at a health food store for three years and thought I knew what I was doing when I joined the major chain. My first 16-hour shift changed my mind. The worst part of the gig was the third shift just before inventory day. We had a baby-faced 20-year-old assistant manager who liked to keep us well past sunrise after an entire night of running prep. Jason, the born-again former meth junkie from Pensacola, was exhausted, drifting in and out of sleep behind the wheel of a forklift, with a 400-pound stack of commercial firewood teetering on the edge of a 12-foot-high pallet. When he was well rested, Jason was unstoppable. High on the newfound drug of the Holy Spirit, he'd practically attack a truckload of heavy volume stock when the rest of us were spent. They told me he had been a house painter when he was still mainlining crank in the devil's armpit that was the Gulf of Mexico. I imagined him painting an entire block of oceanfront condos in one fevered afternoon. Jason had an obese invalid wife who blamed him for their son's death. Buck told me she was a hideous and mean and relied on Jason for basic things like showers and going to the bathroom. Jason was my direct superior, and he liked me because I listened to his biblical theories and never teased him about his wife, which usually meant he chose me to stick by his side for overtime while he avoided home. The best part of the gig was getting picked for the nightly resets. A reset meant we were rearranging the layout of the store. They'd shut it down early, truck in fresh shelving, and again we'd work through the night. We'd usually make it out by one or two in the morning. We didn't have to wear uniforms or deal with customers. Sometimes the music was allowed, but it was the camaraderie that made it what it was. Everyone was tethered to the same chain, digging the same ditch. You didn't get that from a regular store experience, regular hours. It was all about moving up, 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 and out. Get your money and kick down the ladder. I left the health food shop because of the pay, but there had been other perks like all the cheap drugs for sale at the deli kitchen. Everyone there seemed to do other things besides work. We had musicians and artists and girls who could read auras. The assistant manager used to follow the dead, and my grocery supervisor was an amateur gecko breeder. For the reasonable paycheck at Haven's, I had to shave off my beard and tuck in my shirt and take the verbal abuse of a former Marine who smoked menthol cigarettes and drank Diet Mountain Dew all day. I had never worked for a company that insisted upon its quasi-dogma before. Every store had a little shrine in the corner with the founder's glowing image as if he were some kind of deity. Jason had come to believe that there was something vaguely godlike about the founder that the mission of Winter Havens was the continuation of the loaves and fishes miracle from the Gospel of Matthew. I had a 4 a.m. to 1 p.m. shift. I was driving to work in the early dark. I used to think to myself as a top-notch laborer, but now I was the problem guy, a wise ass. I couldn't keep my backstock floats neat enough, and I was getting written up each day. I couldn't get the surplus out. It had been three days so far. I was never able to touch the surplus since the truck shipments took me my whole shift. The brief mornings, we might have gotten a chance to run some surplus. We could only afford a spare hour at the most. By the end of the day, when we hit the replenishment cycle with the scanner guns, we were fucked to know how to cut off all the doubled up excess tags, pushing all the useless stock. You had 10 minutes at the end of your shift. 
You just held your breath and patched the holes in the shells and tripled up on the staples you knew would sell over the day. I was headed south on the highway toward the store when I stopped, pulling the car over to the shoulder of the Catawba River Bridge. I could see the lights in the distance, lights from a North Carolina township glimmering along the black surface of the river which crossed the state line. It was 3.30 in the morning. There were no other cars on the road. I hoisted myself up onto the ledge. I couldn't see in the dark, but I knew from where I stood there were some boulders below. I quit my job the next day. I said to myself that no company or individual would ever put me on a ledge again. I'd rather be a murderer than end up on that ledge in the dark. Buck called me after I hung up my apron. What the hell, man? You were unhappy. You could have just transferred departments. If I left grocery, there'd be nobody in that department. There's nobody left now, asshole. It had to be a clean break, man. I couldn't look at those guys in the face every day for another apartment. You idiot. Winter Haven stock is going through the roof. You could have been a millionaire by the time you hit 30. Yeah, that's the dream they sell you. You son of a bitch. Goodbye, Buck. The first thing I did was contact my old boss at the health food store. I didn't want to seem too desperate. We were still on good terms and often spoke after I left. I worked like a madman on my last two weeks in the hopes that they would rehire me if I ever needed a job again. I texted him, but he never responded. Four days later, I began to feel a little more desperate. My last check from Winter Havens had come through and I had some money saved up. I'd be screwed after paying rent and my electricity next month. I went to Greenpoint Grocery and headed to the deli counter under the guise of buying some pot. I found Damien on the grill and started bullshitting. I bought a gram and had him make me a turkey sandwich. I finally asked about Lizard Man. Oh yeah, Kyle. Kyle don't work here no more. What happened? Oh, he had a fucking meltdown with the new manager and just quit on the spot. God fucking damn it. Not long after that fruitless visit, Kyle, the lizard man, texted me back, asking if they were hiring any good men at Winter Havens. I told him we were both up shit creek. I probably couldn't pass the drug test anyway, he said. Over the next few months, I abstained from doing any coke or smoking weed. I applied for a few more grocery gigs and liquor store jobs. Both jobs required cash register skills. I was a fucking klutz with money. I couldn't balance a till to save my life. I was a backroom guy, a laborer. I couldn't imagine going into something like food service. My car was too beat up to qualify for a ride-sharing app. Another couple of weeks went by. I applied for some warehouse jobs. I had canceled my internet after paying rent. I had to check my email at the library or use the McDonald's Wi-Fi on the phone, which I couldn't afford much longer. Kyle gave me a call to ask if I had any coke to sell him. His regular guy was in jail. I had a half baggie and wasn't planning on snorting till I had work. We agreed to meet at his house. He answered the door in his pajamas and a white t-shirt. He had a gecko on his wrist. What's up, man? Not much. You got a job yet? No, I said. Well, maybe I can help you with that. There was a little girl in the living room watching Sesame Street. I'm watching my niece today, he said, as he set the gecko inside the terrarium. He turned to the girl. Hey, sweetie, Uncle Kyle's going to talk to his friend real quick. Then I'm going to make us lunch, okay? She nodded in silence. We passed through the hall and up the carpeted stairs to his bedroom. You can smoke in here as long as we're upstairs. My sister doesn't like it when we smoke around Kylie, he said as he lit a Newport menthol. Kylie. Yeah, she named her after me. What does your sis do? You don't remember? She's a sales rep at K Jewelers. I stared back down the steps and lit a camel. You sure about leaving her alone in front of the TV? She's not going anywhere. She's a good kid, easy to deal with. One of my geckos bit her the other day, and she took it like a champ. Plus, I'm not trying to buy Yayo in front of her. He handed me the money, and I gave him the half gram. He set it in his bedside drawer. 
So what have you got that might help me? Because I'll be honest with you, I'm fucking broke. I was going to use this money to get lunch and dinner. You're that strapped? Damn, dude. I'll tell you what. Why don't you stick around for hot dogs and a couple of brews and wait till my brother-in-law gets back? That'd be nice. What's he got? He's got some under-the-table work. I can vouch for you. What if he says no? Kyle shrugged. Then no hard feelings? All right. We ate hot dogs in the living room and watched Dora the Explorer with his niece and drank a couple of cans of bush until his brother-in-law showed up. He was a short guy, but extremely muscular. His hair was moose, and he carried a heavy gym bag around his shoulder. He was dark, either Italian or Hispanic. I didn't ask. He took off his Ray-Bans in the living room and pointed at me with them. This one of your buddies, Kyle? He said, in front of his daughter. No, this is Joey. He's from my old team at Greenpoint. Yeah? He doesn't have a job right now. Just left Winter Havens. That company's coming up. Sounds like a poor decision to leave. Well, Eddie, that's kind of what I wanted to talk to you about, Kyle said, standing up. Let's go in the garage alone for a second. Eddie looked at me and then followed Kyle into the hall. I waited a few minutes, watching Dora with the little girl. I knew I wasn't going to get it. Whatever house painting or moving gig he had on the side, I could tell this guy didn't like me. Didn't like coming home to see a stranger in his house, next to his daughter, draining beers in front of the TV. I tell Kyle it was no hard feelings, get the hell out of there, and buy some alcohol and feel sorry for myself at home. Kyle's voice echoed down the hall. Joey, come on in. I stood up and left the girl in the living room and headed for the garage door in the hall. I walked in and Eddie pointed a gun in my face. I was steady. I stared down the barrel. I could tell it was a 9mm knockoff. Kyle was smoking a cigarette behind him. I told you, he doesn't flinch, he said. No, he doesn't, Eddie said, hesitating before he lowered the gun. You ever killed anybody? Nope, I said. You ever try? I shook my head. Anybody ever try to kill you? Yep. Okay, he said, nodding his head. I don't need a career criminal. I need somebody who knows when to lay low and when to walk away. But I can't have someone afraid of bringing the heavy neither. So those two traits are rare in somebody willing to do something illegal. I know. And Kyle says you got him. I paused for a moment. So are you going to let me into the fold or what? When we pull this off, I never want to see you again. I get a bad feeling and I pull the plug. I never want to see you again. It's a safety thing. We don't know each other anymore. Now, you two have a connection. That worries me. I'm going to need you to tourniquet that shit from this point on. We got to think about business. The reason people go to jail is because they don't plan not to. Are we in agreement? I agree, I said. He turned to Kyle. Are we in agreement? I got you. All right, Eddie said, clapping his hands together. Let's talk details. I didn't sleep the night before. I lied in bed and thought about the job. It was a smash and grab. A 30-year-old parolee from the East Washington Apartments Unit 7G was selling molly, Xanax, codeine, and massive amounts of weed. He was small time, but word had gotten around that he was about 15 grand in cash. Eddie told us he had a friend. The dealer couldn't link back to us, case the place for him during the controlled buys. He was on parole, that's why he didn't deal in the harder stuff. Eddie figured he wouldn't have a gun on him either. I called bullshit on that assumption. If he's selling, he's already got a safe, and he'll already have a gun. Maybe not an AR-15, but he'll carry a pistol on him. The name of the game was In and Out. We had to subdue this guy the minute we kicked in the door, then grab the cash and run. He lived alone, according to Eddie. I took a shower in the morning and put on some drab clothing. I forced myself to eat an egg with toast. I didn't want to eat, but I knew I was going to get sick if I didn't. I got in my car and sipped a monster as I drove to Kyle and Eddie's place. 
There was a heavy thunderstorm on its way. The edge of the horizon was nearly black with dark clouds, while the sky overhead was still bright. The green energy drink was sweet and my heart raced as I sipped. I had my loaded 357 in the glove box. When I got to Kyle's place, I took it out and shoved it in my belt loop. I sat on the hood of my car and drank my monster. A minute later, the garage door opened and piled into Eddie's Honda. Each moment felt empty and painfully quiet. Kyle looked back at me with, from the shotgun seat. Think of it like going to work, he said. Just let your instincts take over. You have breakfast, Eddie said. Yeah. Poor decision. I never eat before a job. You worried I'm going to throw up? No, it's just good to stay hungry. Keep your thoughts lean. How many times have you done this? A few, Eddie said. I looked at Kyle. You? Once, he said. It was raining when we got there. The gutter was swelling with dirty water. The guy's unit was one flight up the concrete and metal stairwell. I didn't like it. It was too easy to see us coming. The guy could shoot back at us as we escaped. There's no other exit? One way in, one way out. Don't park the car here, it's too close. Are you in charge now? You can't let him know what your car looks like if he catches a glimpse through the window. Park over by the mailboxes. Eddie didn't acknowledge me, but followed the direction just the same. We got out of the car and my stomach dropped. I checked my belt to make sure I had my gun underneath my shirt. We headed through the rain up the stairwell. Our footfalls echoed through the open air corridor as we approached the dealer's front door. Eddie knocked with the butt of his gun. We saw light in the peephole. Someone was looking through as the light dimmed. I hung back with Kyle at the edge of the railing. What can I do for you, friend? Eddie kept his gun out of sight and flashed a $20 bill at the peephole. Looking to get a gram. I don't know you, man. Come on, man. I'm from out of town. I just want to buy some quality bud and smoke it alone in my hotel room. I've got back problems. I shook my head. He was talking too much. That's not how a smash and grab is supposed to work. I took a deep breath and pushed Eddie out of the way and drew my pistol. I shot out the lock and kicked the door in. The guy was pushed back by the force of the door. I bashed him upside the head with the hot barrel of the 357 and turned him onto his stomach. I sat on his hands and knees and pressed my gun against his face. Where's the safe? I ain't got no safe. I started beating his face with the butt of the gun. Kyle and Eddie were shuffling through the apartment like idiots. One of them tried to close the door even though I had shot out the knob. The hole was big enough to stick your hand through. The chain hadn't been set, which made it easier to kick open. Where the fuck is your safe, motherfucker? It's in the closet by the bedroom. Eddie and Kyle moved into the bedroom and opened up the closet. What's the code? 6675. I looked up at Eddie. You got that? I heard the beeps as he pressed the buttons on the keypad. It ain't opening, he said. I pressed the barrel of the gun against the dealer's head. I'm gonna fucking kill you. You gotta hit pound first. You gotta hit pound first for fuck's sake. It's a safe, not a cell phone. You think we're fucking stupid? It's a custom keypad, I swear to God. I heard Eddie frantically pushing in the code. The safe opened and Kyle grabbed the money and threw it into the black backpack. Small rolls of wrinkled bills, mostly, and a few crisp stacks of 20s. Let's go, I said. Eddie and Kyle were still going through the safe, stealing bottles of pills and bags of weed. Let's go, I said. We're gone. It's over. I looked up from the living room. Kyle and Eddie were still raiding the safe. There was a figure behind them. My adrenaline surged. The girl standing there was so still. I thought she was a poster for a split second, then realized she had been hiding in the bathroom. She had a Glock in her raised hand and fired it. The muzzle flash and smoke looked so foreign in the small bedroom. Kyle went down with the bag in his hand. The side of his head was blackened with spurting blood. I jumped off the dealer's body and ran out the door. 
Eddie was close behind me, but the parolee pushed himself from the carpet and tackled him into the kitchen. The girl fired another shot, and I felt the force of the bullet crush my shoulder blade. I fell down the concrete steps. My pistol slipped from my hands and discharged as it landed. I dragged myself into the corner. I was bleeding down my side. I could hear sirens in the distance. I heard more yelling from the unit above, and then four gunshots. Eddie was probably dead. I reached over with my good hand and grabbed my pistol, since it was registered in my name, then dragged myself down the corridor where the apartments ended. The lightning flashed overhead. I threw myself into the elephant grass and reeds beside the creek. I stared upward at the falling rain, hidden in the coarse strands of green, and fell asleep.